One day, while the bus was waiting for other students, you and your friend decided to play with a toy car on top of a table. So your friend turns on the car on one end of the table and the car goes to the other end to you. Now you being a curious mind, you think of these three questions. What was the speed of the car when it reached your hand? How much time did the car take? And what was the acceleration produced in the car? Now since you bought the car, you know these two values. What is the mass of the car? And what force it will produce when you turn it on? To answer this question, you turn towards Newton's laws of motion, specifically Newton's second law of motion. Please feel free to pause the video to read through this. Both of these are different ways to state Newton's second law. But in short, it just says that the acceleration of the object will be directly proportional to the net force applied. The arrow on top of both of these variables denotes that both of these are vector quantities. Moving ahead, we have mass which is inversely proportional to the acceleration. And since the mass is scalar quantity, this equation tells us that the direction of acceleration will be the same as the direction of the force. And here we get this famous equation f is equal to ma. The next day, while the bus was waiting for other students, you wanted to play again, only to find out that your friend is not here today. So looking at the stationary car on top of the table, you started thinking about Newton's second law. You realize that when there is no force, there is no acceleration produced in the car. However, you remember reading about Newton's first law and you realize that both of these are actually the same thing. That got you thinking that F is equals to MA is Newton's second law and in that equation, if you put force is equals to zero, you get acceleration equals to zero. So why there is Newton's first law? Why there are two different laws and not one? You got shocked to see that the toy car moved on top of the table. And you started thinking, how did the car came towards you when it was off and nobody was pushing it? How did you see an acceleration without a force? Are Newton's laws wrong? But then you quickly realize that since there was no windows in the bus, you didn't notice that the bus moved. And that showed you the importance of Newton's first law. So Newton's first law is actually a prerequisite to Newton's second law. And the accelerating bus was what we called a non-inertial frame of reference. So, Newton's first law basically defines what is inertial frame of reference. And in that inertial frame of reference, Newton's second law holds true. And this is why we have two different laws. Let's now discuss the most famous and the most misunderstood law, which is Newton's third law of motion. Famously, it says that every action has equal and opposite reaction. While this phrase is not wrong, it's incomplete and misleading. Notice these two words, action and reaction. Upon hearing, you might think that there is something happening first, which is known as action, and that triggers and leads to something which happens later known as reaction. This is not what Newton's third law says. Similarly, notice this phrase in the middle, equal and opposite. While this is not wrong, it's incomplete. So let's understand this law a bit better. 
Imagine that you are standing on a floor with a ball in your hand and you drop the ball on the floor. Now let's analyze what happened between the ball and the floor. So the Newton's third law actually says this, that the force by object 1 on object 2 and the force by object 2 on object 1 at any instant. So notice, there is no action and reaction here. It's not like that the force applied by the ball was an action which happened first and the force applied with the floor was a reaction happened later. They both got applied at the same instant. And you can in fact ask these questions about any force. So which object is applying the force? On which object the force is being applied to? And at what instant the force is being applied? So this further says that the forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. However, if you notice this case, let's imagine that for some reason the ball is applying force in this diagonal and the float is applying force going up towards the left in this diagonal. The statement on the left still holds true for this scenario but this is not what Newton's third law says so we will have to add another phrase to our statement that the forces are along the line joining the object and this is what Newton's third law of motion says the process to answer our initial questions is known as particle dynamics and it simply says that given some initial conditions we want to know the positions and the velocity at all later given instant in time so before even moving ahead let's discuss what is a particle it simply means that for now i am not interested in the inner structure or inner working of the particle or any object. If the whole object is moving together with same velocity or acceleration, for me it is just one point. So let's put our particle at the origin of our 3D axis which has x, y and z axis. Imagine that at time t equals to 0 there was a force f applied to the particle and during your observation, due to that force, the particle moved in the 3D space. Using Newton's second law, we know that acceleration will be force upon mass. And we can write acceleration as double derivative of the position vector. To make our life and calculation easier, we can resolve this force in all three different axes. So fx, fy and fc. And whatever analysis we do to any one of these axes can be applied to the rest of the two. Let's move with our analysis in just one dimension, which is x here in this case. So notice that this force fx may be a constant or it may depend on the position of the particle which happens in case of pendulum. The force may also depend on the velocity of particle and that happens in case of let's say air resistance and the magnetic force on a moving charged particle via a magnetic field. Furthermore the force may also depend time. If the force is not constant and it depends and changes with respect to any of, these, any of these parameters, we have different tools and methods to do this analysis. But if it happens to be that our force is a constant, we will have a constant acceleration. And here, 
we can integrate this equation once to get this dx over dt equals to ax t plus c1. Integrate it one more time and you will get this equation where c2 and c1 are integration constants. Notice that we have our initial condition that at t is equals to 0, the particle was at origin. So that means that x was 0. Putting that into the equation, you will get the value of c2 as 0. Notice here that negative time is not an invalid thing. The time t equals to 0 simply denotes that we started our observation or experiment at that particular instant. Moving ahead, putting the value of c to 0 in the equation will give us this. On the other hand, from the first equation, if we use our second initial condition that at time t equals to 0, we know the velocity of the particle, also known as initial velocity of the particle, to be u. Solving this equation will give you the value of c1. Putting it back in the first equation will give you this. And we know that dx over dt is nothing but velocity v. So that happens to be vx equals to ax t plus ux. Putting the value of c1 in the second equation will give you this. And this is x equals to half ax t square plus ux t. The subscripts x simply denotes that this equation is on the x axis side of things. And this same analysis applies on y and z axis as well. And using these two equation, we can answer the, our first initial questions which we asked in this video.